This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing Mark Carrigan this afternoon. Um, Mark is a sociologist and describes himself also as an academic technologist, which I think is a, a really nice way of putting the sort of work that a lot of people do now, stretched across lots of different areas of activity. Um, Mark has very many hats. Um, he's doing a part-time PhD at Warwick. He's a research associate at LSE's Public Policy Group and also consultant on an ESRC-funded project at the Open University, as well as lots of other things that I think you're going to hear about today. Uh, so hand over to Mark. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so like, the idea of an academic technologist is just the, it's the least clumsy term I've hit upon to try and articulate a very diverse range of things I've got into the habit of doing over the last five years or so. And, you know, to a certain extent, this diversity has been a product of necessity. I didn't get PhD funding, so did my, I've been doing my PhD part-time. And I'm now finally at the end of it, which is very nice. But along the way, I've collected a whole host of different activities. And the one uh, con constant among them is, uh, is blogging, really. And it's something I've become very passionate about. It's something that can really add to individual experiences of academia, but also academic quality life as a whole, the kinds of communications that we have, and not just the quantity, but the quality of them as well. And so today, I'm going to just introduce academic blogging as a concept, and I'm sure some of you will be very familiar with academic blogs, so hopefully I've pitched it all right. But then to try and explore some of the different forms blogging is taking, hopefully as a way of helping you if you are thinking of starting to blog to be clearer about what it is you want to do and how you might go about doing it. And if you are already blogging, hopefully just to bring your input and bring your experience and help other people to learn from it as well. And so I've been blogging uh, in one guise or another for about a decade now, but it's only in the last three or four years that it's become something quite important to my academic life. Uh, I run a personal blog, uh, which I'll show you in a few moments. I also run a sociology site called The Sociological Imagination, which has probably contributed more to my visibility within my discipline than anything I'm likely to write for quite some time, which is an important point about the way in which blogs not destabilise, but open up traditional trajectories of accumulating visibility and recognition within the academy. And I also guest blog quite widely on a range of sites, uh, some of which I'll show you today. But first, just as a sort of preliminary to highlight some of the major issues involved in academic blogging. Uh, this is a question I asked on my blog, suitably enough, uh, about a year ago. And so to try and get answers from people about why do you find blogging useful, and these are some of the many answers that I got. And I think it's, uh, if you're unsure about blogging, because uh, as I wrote on the blog post that is attached to this session, I've noticed that just in the last six months particularly, there seems to have been this sudden change in institutional culture, where what was once seen as a very marginal activity, perhaps even a questionable one, has now come to be regarded as an imperative. Um, on the one hand, I'm very enthusiastic, you know, I think this recognition of academic social media use in general and blogging in particular is great. But on the other, I do find it a bit worrying because when I do these sorts of sessions, I've very frequently had people who, once I've started to talk to them, I've not really understood why they wanted to blog and I've often felt that they didn't really understand that as well. And so I think if you are interested in blogging, you know, it's good to think about exactly why you want to do it. And one way of helping get a sense of this is to ask other people, people who are already doing it as part of their day-to-day -day working practices, what is it they get out of it? Why do they find it useful in a professional capacity? And so these are some of the many reasons uh, that it helps break down ideas and research into smaller, more accessible pieces. It helps you learn to articulate yourself better for a non-specialist audience. And you know, the academic blogosphere, to use a term that I don't really like, is uh, you know, something quite differentiated. So a non-specialist audience might still be academics, but people outside your topic area, outside your discipline, outside uh, in the humanities or in the social sciences or in the natural sciences. And it can really change how you write and how you think about presentation. 
Uh, this is one that is, really resonates with me uh, in terms of my experience. Is I've always been someone who writes notes about things that I'm reading. Uh, except I have very bad handwriting. I'm particularly interested in what I'm doing. I tend to write at a frantic pace, scroll, and not be able to read the notes later. Whereas this experience, which I know anecdotally a lot of people have had, is that the knowledge that someone is going to read your blog post, it just composes the discipline. You don't write in mental ease, you don't write in shorthand. It just forces you to write in coherent, sustained sentences and to really spell out ideas. And you know, I think that kind of iterative dimension of scholarship is something very important which fits with blogging very well. The sort of process of you know, you, you, you've got something you're trying to say, and it's trying again and again. And in the process of trying to write it and trying to extricate it and turn something tacit into something explicit, that's, I think, what development of ideas fundamentally is at a basic level. And blogging, because it's free, because it's instantaneous, is a very natural forum for it. You often find that you get very helpful comments, both from people within your field, and if you work in an area where you do empirical research that involves participants, you might begin to find that your participants read your blog, or people from the groups you're researching read your blog. That's certainly been my experience, and it can be immensely helpful when the people you're writing about are actually reading what you write, and writing back to you. You know, it's very challenging as well, but because I think it unsettles and destabilizes a lot of traditional assumptions about how researchers relate to the communities they're researching. Uh, networking, which is a horrible term that I hate for something that I think everyone unavoidably does and has to do. And you know, blogging is quite a natural forum for this because as you start to blog regularly, you will begin to assemble an audience around you. So the people who choose to read, find out about your blog and read your blog is a contribution to your network of a very interesting and potentially very valuable sort. Uh, it makes writing something that can be very regular uh, it can make it part of your daily life. And I think, particularly for PhD students, it can help overcome some of the anxieties that are attached to academic writing to make it something that you're used to. So publishing in the sense of, you know, the etymologically, in terms of making public, to, for making public of your ideas to be something that is part of your daily life, that's something familiar and comfortable. And I think that's valuable in its own right, but it has all sorts of uh, broader ramifications for your career outside of your blog. Uh, again, uh, this is a you know, similar notion about that the blogging about something, it helps, uh, as she puts it, iron out her thoughts. You know, it helps you become better at articulating yourself just through practice, and it's very easy, very accessible, instantaneous form of practice. This has been less my own experience, uh, where you can really gauge the quality of what you've written by the feedback it gets. But I tend to write on topics which are either very obscure or quite broad, so I think it depends on what it is you work on exactly. Uh, and I think this is quite common as well, to use it as a, as a journal, as a notebook, which is an idea I'll come on to in, in a minute, where it becomes something where, you know, iteratively you update it. It's keeping a research log, a research diary, but doing it in a public forum, which can be a slightly jarring change of uh, pace, but you know, a lot of people who do this, including myself, have found it immensely valuable. And again, uh, it helps you write for a wider audience, both in terms of the style in which you learn to write, because you can't assume specialised subdisciplinary knowledge. But also because it puts your ideas out there and you know, the more you blog, the more of an academic footprint you have online and the easier you are to discover. The easier you are for people outside the academy to discover you as well. Because I blog about one of my research topics, asexuality, a lot, I know from past experience that when journalists type in asexuality research, they find me on the first page. And the collaborations that's given rise to have been immensely rewarding for me. I've really enjoyed them. And they've been instrumentally valuable as well. And there's no reason why that isn't a generalizable experience that everyone who blogs about their research on a regular basis. And so here I think are some important questions to start to think about if you are either already you put your toe in the water or you're thinking of doing so. Yeah, just be clear about what it is you hope to achieve. Uh, who are you blogging for? 
how much are you willing to share either of your work? And there are obvious issues, depending on the field you work in, about what you do share and what you don't share. What anxieties do you have about blogging as a researcher? And you know, just being explicit about them for yourself doesn't make them go away, but I think it's very valuable to, at the outset, be clear about what attracts you about this, but also what worries you about it. And how will you fit blogging into your day-to-day -day working routines? Because uh, it's something that, you know, one of the most frequent questions people ask themselves is how do you find the time to blog? And I think you have to be realistic about how much time you have, but also be aware of the different ways in which you can make it part of your working life. Uh, and so, you know, increasingly, the kinds of apps you get for phones and tablets are very feasible to blog from. You know, I do a lot of writing when I'm on trains, for instance. I tend to proofread at first when I get home to go on the safe side, because it's hard to write, you know, effectively on a, key on a small keyboard. Yeah, but think about the gaps you have in your life and how you could fit logging into them. And there's a whole range of different uses of your blog. So it can be a supplement to, and or even a replacement for an e-portfolio or online CV. You can use it for brainstorming and note taking, keeping track of things you're reading, and so short posts or longer formal writing, connecting with people outside the academy, blogging about academic papers, and personally I think that's the one when this kind of activity becomes mainstream. I can't see why this isn't something that everyone would do, where if you're engaging with scholarship, you blog what you think about it, and it can start conversations that can be immensely valuable. Uh, updating others on what you're doing, you know, uh, events, publications, etc., and podcasting or video casting. I mean, being a regular blogger got me into podcasting. It's something that I find immensely enjoyable, and it's great because you know, if I read a book by a world-renowned scholar, if I were to email them and say, "Hi, oh, you don't know me, but can I come and chat to you about your book for an hour?" They'd obviously say no. But when it's, "Can I come and do a podcast interview with you?" They say yes, and particularly at this stage, there's still not much academic buy-in into podcasting, which always baffles me. Um, but you know, there's a lot of opportunities that are out there to go and interview people, and it's not a hard thing to do. And a blog gives you a natural place to put this. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a range of services you can use, uh, which I don't think we'll really have time to cover today, but there's a resource pack I put together, which I think Matt can circulate. Uh, via the blog, which has a uh, range of guides about the advantages and disadvantages of different blogging services. I mean, uh, I personally recommend WordPress, but Tumblr's also a possibility to find what it is you want to do. So things like <coughs> Posturus, which is now sadly defunct, and Tumblr are good for more informal blogging, where it's just very quick to set up and get started. But if you want to do something more multifaceted, WordPress is better. And it's important to tell people about your blog. So, for instance, put it in your email signature. And particularly if you connect your blog to do updates on Facebook or Twitter, that can be a very powerful mechanism, both for raising your profile on Twitter, but also using your network on Twitter to help spread awareness of your blog posts. And over the last few years, you know, most people who edit blogs will report that Twitter has gone from being a fairly minor source of traffic to now being a major one. And it makes it really easy because WordPress is set up so that you can just automatically connect your Twitter account so everything gets posted on the site and uh, a lot of people see it very quickly. Yeah, I said about the notebooking because uh, this is my favourite uh, use of uh, a blog. And I think this is where it's, it's possible to get beyond the appearance of novelty. And so, you know, I think this technology is still very new in academic context. It's shiny, unfamiliar, and slightly scary at times to people who haven't been using it previously. But I think it just gives a, a new, it's a new tool to do something that has long been a part of scholarship. I mean, do any of you know C. Wright Mills, the American sociologist and public intellectual? Uh, he's one of my personal heroes, and in a book he wrote, I mean, 50, 60 years ago now, he talked about the need to keep a file as a way of capturing fringe thoughts, ideas which may be byproducts of everyday life, conversations overheard on the street, or dreams. And he wrote about this in terms of that keeping the file helps you develop self reflective habits. You learn to, as he put it, keep your inner world awake. 
And whenever you feel strongly about events or ideas, do not let them pass from your mind, but instead to try and formulate them for your file. And in doing so, draw out their implications. And you know, this is how I personally use my, my blog. It's just where I write ideas. And the fact people read it makes me be more disciplined than I would otherwise be at actually explicating those ideas properly. And I think it's that kind of, uh, you know, the iterative use of the blog to put things on there, see what reaction they get, and to just get into the habit of using it as a public forum in which you can start to spell out ideas, big or small, connect them together. That it can be something that it, you know, people have always done this. It's just a new tool with which to do it. Okay, well, hopefully that gave you a useful overview of the broad area there. And then uh, for the rest of the hour, uh, I was going to go through some of the main types of blogging. So personal blogging, guest blogging, group blogging, and project blogging. And um, I'll show you some examples, and please feel free to chip in and you know, say what, you've, what you're interested in, what you're not interested in, what you like about some of these examples, and what you don't. Uh, so yeah, this is just a, a few examples, uh, just because they're sites I looked at recently, really, um, and I think they illustrate the potential quite well. Uh, Paul Bernal is a lecturer in law at University of East Anglia, and he's someone who he blogs very regularly about uh, legal internet and privacy issues on his site. Um, I think he gets an awful lot. He gets an awful lot of traffic. Yeah, in the I think he's been blogging for a few years and the 671,000 uh, page impressions that he's got. And what he writes, he always puts a picture in, and it tends to be long form articles, which often get picked up by other blogs, where, because, and in my capacity editing one of the LC blogs previously, that's how I got talking to Paul, because you know, occasionally it's something where you just email him and ask, could we repost this with a link back to the original? And so it's just a public forum where he does these, uh, you know, it's, I think the writing style he adopts is halfway between a set of speculative notes and an article for a magazine or newspaper, where it's very easily accessible, where he deploys his academic research and his specialist knowledge in the analysis. But he does so in a very digestible style. He likes using subheadings a lot and uh, yeah, I think he blogs once a week, twice a week usually. They circulate very widely online, journalists and blog editors pick them up and he tends to attract quite a lot of comments in the opinion, uh, in the comments section, some of which can be very helpful. He's got a very short profile of himself on here, which links to a more static portfolio site elsewhere. So, you know, it's very much a blog that serves one purpose. It's a place to write these articles, post them, and help them circulate online. Uh, Deborah Lupton is a sociology professor in Australia who does works on a very, very wide range of issues, actually. And uh, so on her blog, she sometimes puts announcements about projects she's involved in. So this is a research network for self-quantification. And not dissimilarly to Paul, uh, Deborah tends to write one article every week or so, uh, every, no, every two weeks, I think she said. And again, she puts a picture on it, and it's, you know, these, these are works in progress from her, uh, I think. So I know, for instance, she's writing a book on digital sociology at the moment. And on her blog, she tends to take one big theme, so things like the role of metrics in academic life, or the role of metaphor in debates about big data. And these are things that I know she's reading a lot of literature on that are going into her book. And the articles she has in her blog are, you know, they draw these strands together and present her emerging viewpoint in a way that's intended to be as digestible as possible. And so it helps raise the profile of her work and her ideas. But I think it also serves that purpose for her of helping her become clear about what it is, uh, you know, the, what is she's trying to say about these themes. And uh, again, just like Paul's, it's the kind of uh, it's the kind of articles that are very, di you know, very easily digestible, are open to non-specialists, and tend to circulate quite widely online. 
this is my own blog where I tend to post all sorts of things. So random snippets of articles that I've read, announcements for upcoming events that I'm involved in or that I'm helping someone promote, and occasionally uh, longer opinion pieces. And it's become an index for things that I do, and it helps me keep track of things that I do and think about how they fit together into one actually overarching working life through organising them. And it helps me uh, raise awareness of them, and it's a very, I find it a very useful tool for promoting events, for instance, particularly because I put a call for papers on here, it gets sent out to Twitter. Uh, unlike Paul, I keep all my portfolio stuff on the site itself, so it was a replacement when I started doing this for my ePortfolio at Warwick. And so those are just uh, three examples, almost at random really, of how you can use uh, a personal blog. And I think this is something that's going to be more common, and one thing that really interests me is the convergence between uh, you know, academic employment situation, particularly for PhDs and early career researchers, and people working in the creative industries. Like A lot of my friends have been working as photographers and designers, and there, everyone who's trying to break into that sort of field will have their own website, they will have their own portfolio, which they update on a regular basis. And I suspect it's something that's going to become a lot more common uh, in the Academy, and I think there's a lot of advantages to it. I mean, as I've already described, I find it immensely useful to have this forum where I can get feedback, where I can instantly reflect on stuff that I'm reading. I can start to spell out ideas that I'm developing, and I can use in a nakedly self-promotional way when I need to to help promote events or announcements about things I've had, I've had published. So, I mean, is, does anyone in here have their own personal blog, and if so, how are you using it? Um, um, very, very poorly. <laughs> it's been um, it's been nine months since my last confession, <laughs> sort of. So, um, I mean, I've got questions, but then you want to keep those for the end. Uh, no, I'm just happy to talk now uh, because I've done my little I think, spiel at the start. One of one of the um, one of my I mean, I, I'm sort of interested in, in in what you were saying about the, you know having a blog and an e-portfolio. And I'm, I'm thinking about my own general digital pres presence on, on the web. Uh, as I said, I have one blog uh, which has been fairly irregular and which is on a specific topic. Um, sometimes I want to write about uh, more other topics, uh, more variety, but I don't know what to do. Um, set up a separate one or simply expand the first one or run two simultaneously or drop the one and set up a new one. Um, and, and there's other aspects of the, I suppose, e-portfolio, um, you know, academia, EDU, where you post papers and articles versus the institutional repository. And it's sort of, well, what's, is it, is it simply fragmentation to go for everything and you lose uh, momentum, you lose impact, you lose visibility, or does it increase it? Uh, that's, that's uh, I think it definitely decreases it, I mean, all of the things being equal. Uh, because, I mean, I treat this site as a, almost a, a book kit that whenever there's something I want to put out into the world, just throw it in there. And I'm probably less thematically organised than, you know, there are downsides to this. Apart, you know, I think that the people who read my blog do so for very different reasons, and much of it isn't interesting to many other people. But I think in general, it's about the, uh, you know, the frequency with which you update, because uh, I'm a huge enthusiast for social media and academic life, as you've no doubt noticed. But one of the downsides is that it is a form of communication that rewards recurrent shouting. So I mean, the shouting is an unfair term, actually. I mean, it's not about how loud you shout, it's about how regularly you say stuff. And the danger of fragmenting <coughs> your online presence is that you're only doing a little bit on different sites. Mm -hmm. And you know, in terms of the solidification of habits, you know, the way in which, rather than it being something you have to write and have to do this to do, it's something that occurs spontaneously. I think that's less likely to happen if you have a distributed set of sites. I mean, myself, I have my blog, I have a Twitter profile, and I have an academia.edu, which I don't update very often. <coughs> and the advantage of academia.edu is it's the place to store the papers. Mm -hmm. And if you check the stats, I mean, people are reading them, but there's no reason why you can't use that to host the papers, but also have a page on your blog that links to them. 
Uh, yeah. Um, I have a question, comment. Um, I think quite a few people uh, observe or suggest that there's been a kind of shift of emphasis <coughs> away uh, towards Twitter and away from longer form blogging. Um, I wondered if you would agree with that, and if so, what you think about or um, what, what might explain that. Uh, I, I think there is, and I think it's maybe less of a time investment, and it particularly. I mean, I think it both will objectively tend to be less of a time investment to use Twitter rather than blogging. And I think it also, more importantly, will, particularly at the outset, very much seem like it will take less time, even though I think Twitter can be a, a time drain in a potentially slightly dangerous, dangerous way. Because um, I, I think Twitter, you know, it is, uh, there was a lot of scepticism I encountered even just a year or two ago within academic uh, events and academic spaces about Twitter because it's seen as ephemeral, you know, it's seen as froth, how much can you really express in 140 <coughs> characters? But I mean the truth is you can actually express a surprising amount in 140 characters. And particularly in terms of the circulation of ideas, the circulation of content, this is something that, you know, a large part of scholarly interaction revolves around it. And so I think academics are actually very natural users of Twitter, but I also think academics are very natural bloggers. And so the increasing acceptance, and in some cases institutional pressure developing to use these tools, will mean that as much as all of the things being equal, I think academics are very well suited to both blogging and Twitter. I think it's a contingent product of the way in which these things are becoming mainstreamed, that people will go for one or the other. So people might, for instance, see blogging as being something relatively old-fashioned, now that microblogging is achieving the prominence it has. But my experience has been the two things work best when they're hand in hand. Uh, because the more people follow you on Twitter, the more people read your blog posts. But the more regularly you're blogging, the more people would want to follow you on Twitter. So I think it's a virtuous cycle. But I think it's one that can easily you know, leave a feeling like you'd have to choose between them. And that's ultimately a question of just being realistic about how much time and effort you are open to putting into this. Um, I'm blogging, um, I would say, irregularly, but often I try to be frequently. But um, my question is, how much you release, how much of your ideas you release, especially when you are in a book writing process? I know that some academics use the blog for, um, as you said, for a form of ideas and all these, and Actually, all these ideas at some point uh, went down as a book, like uh, example, an example of Graham Cronall from um, Work, I think. Should you just that? Work, anyway. Um, educator, she's an educator. But I don't know how much you release, especially when you are in a research process or. I think it. Do you know in about 20 of your ideas, is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think this is one of the most. Idea, and then somebody else push. Yeah, somebody yeah. else takes it afterwards, and and also, I mean, from the publisher's point of view, um, the content in the book needs to be original somehow. You can't duplicate it all over. Publishers love this stuff, though, because one of the main structural challenges that academic publishers face is how to raise awareness of the things that they're publishing. And so, yeah, I mean, there is a real issue here, but I think publishers are, generally speaking, very enthusiastic about academics using social media, because it means the academics are actually promoting yes. the books themselves. But I think this is obviously the, the much broader uh, question. And so there are the, the copyright issues. And so one thing to think about is how you, like Creative Commons is a series of licenses determining what people can do with content on your site. And it's important. Well, my site is, for example, Creative Commons license. I have already done that. And I allow reuse. That's why um, I'm saying how much you release, especially when you write a book, how much of these ideas you release out there. Well, my uh, intuition is to release a lot, but I realise that's not for everyone. But from my point of view, it's a case of using it to develop the ideas in process. I mean, I see it as like, you know. Um, we can often fall into seeing the internet as a, as a virtual space as opposed to the real world. And I think it's not, it's just a different way in which people communicate. And there are some uh, divergences, yeah, but 
you know, the psychology of writing an extended blog post about something that I'm working on, you know, this connects to, uh, I've got a book under, uh, under review at the moment about social media and blogging. And so these are ideas today that I will talk about in the book if it gets accepted. And the, you know, for me, the psychology of uh, blogging about something that I'm working on is identical to talking at a conference about it. It's talking about it as a work in progress where, you know, you're preparing a talk or you're preparing a blog post because it helps you <coughs> make these things more coherent in your own mind and because you value the feedback and you want to see what people make of them. And, you know, there's obviously a fine line between them. So I wouldn't, I've never, would never post e extracts of research data on my blog. I just wouldn't. And I think if anyone who took part in a research project that I undertook would be very, I think they'd find it very strange if they came across extracts of the transcripts on their blog. And, you know, I wouldn't post anything verbatim, you know, that's yet to be published, but that's for copyright as much as anything else. And I think it's a case of being very, you know, becoming clear about what precisely your fear is. And, you know, working around that, you know, there's no, there's nothing about this technology which prescribes a specific kind of sharing. It's a case of working out what you want to do with it. And if you are uncomfortable with posting anything that connects too closely to, say, a book you're working on, then you know, don't do it. There's no need to. There's no need to push yourself out of, your, out of the comfort zone with it. But all I caution is just be clear about exactly what the fear is. Because I, I think people can sometimes be, as a matter of reflex, slightly more nervous about sharing ideas online than they would be at a conference. Because the obvious disanalogy is that you don't know who's reading it. But similarly, you know, at a conference, you don't know everyone in the audience. And you know, it's, I think it's not fundamentally very different from other forms of academic sharing. Yeah, I think um, that's one of the things I need to overcome because I've noticed that when I'm writing for the blog, I'm highly motivated to write. When I close the blog and go back to the world and start writing about the book, um, I have a blog. <laughs> so if I'm going to write for the blog, all the ideas just flowing. <coughs> And with a book, just unstuck. So I would like very much to be able to combine those two uh, somehow, because I know that it's, it's highly motivating. Because, uh, yeah, the I, mean, blogging, I mean, that's very much my experience, because articulating ideas sparks further ideas. And, you know, it, the, the, the sort of publishing online in this way can be a site of anxiety for people, but it can also be a, you know, something that's really liberating. Because, uh, you know, I feel very free about developing ideas, developing provisional thoughts, testing the water, playing with things when I post them on my blog in a way that I wouldn't if I was submitting something as a journal article. And the feedback can be very useful here. I mean, it's something that I'm always aware of when I do these kinds of sessions that I think I, you know, I feel like I'm repeating it over and over again. But I really think if there is one rule of academic blogging, it is just that you need to determine what you are comfortable with and what you want to get out of it. Because just because someone else is using it in a certain way doesn't mean that's the right way for you. And it's just being reflexive about it. And I mean, I'm showing examples here today, just as you know, uh, cases to see about how other people are using it. Um, because Deborah and Paul, who I, you know, the two other blogs I showed, I mean, they're people who they don't really post works in progress in the way that I do. You know, I'll often post bullet point lists of ideas just to get them out of my head and throw them out into the world. And there's a whole range of different ways people are using this stuff. It's just trying to work out what works for you, and then just explore it. Uh, okay, I'll just move on quickly then, because I'm aware of the time running out, uh, to show some examples of uh, places where you can guest blog. So if you're interested in writing for the <coughs> internet, if you're writing about your research or related issues, but you don't think you're going to have the time to sustain your own blog, and I think it's good to be realistic about that, and if you don't, you don't. But that doesn't mean you can't write online, because an awful lot of sites now rely on people doing guest posts for them. And the number of people who can sustain a very regular, you know, very regular blogging is obviously mu much smaller than the number of people who can and would want to, you know, write a blog post every month, every few months, once a year. And, you know, it's good to be aware of the way in which increasingly there are opportunities for you to publish online without starting your own blog. And there are a lot of advantages to this because it means you don't have to write regularly. 
you can piggyback, so to speak, on an existing audience and they will help disseminate your post very widely. And in a lot of cases, they'll help with editing as well. And so you might end up with a much more fully worked out post than you would otherwise. So for instance, this is the LC review of books, uh, which posts one or two book reviews a day. They'll supply you with the book. And they've got some formatting guidelines, so all the posts, I think, are between uh, 600 and 1,000 words. But the editors will work with you to help you um, develop the review, and then it'll get circulated very widely online. And so, as an alternative to reviewing books for journals, same principle, but more people will read it, uh, if you do it this way, you know, quite bluntly. That's as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, this is the RC Politics blog, um, which I used to edit for uh, earlier on this year and last year. And this does twice daily updates on politics and policy issues, hence the name. Where it's quite specialised, but a very broad range of people write for it, and it has an enormous uh, audience. And again, this is the kind of site where if you, you know, a lot of sites fall into this category where if it is a blog that has multiple authors, if you look at the contact page or the about page, you will often find now an explicit invitation to submit content for the site, to submit articles for the site. And even if not, if you're interested in guest blogging, if you just email the people you find as the point of contact and just say, I'm interested in writing an article on this issue, does it sound like something you'd like for the site? And you know, if it, unless it is wildly unsuitable for the site, they will almost always say yes to this. And when it is sites that have been going for quite a long time, like the LSE sites, you know, it gives uh, it gives a visibility, and it can be a very good way of dipping a toe in the water. So if you either think that you definitely won't have time to run your own blog, or you're not sure what to make of the whole blogging thing, you know, just trying to do a review for the LC Review of Books, or write something for one of the other LC sites can be quite a helpful route into it. And so this is the uh, LSE Impact blog, which is, uh, as you might expect, discusses a lot of on impact issues. But also things like public engagement, and it's become quite an interesting hub for uh, you know, anything to do with scholarly practice and technology in academic life. And if you are you know, interested enough to come to this session today, you probably, if you're not already reading it, would quite enjoy the site. And uh, yeah, again, um, they accept guest posts. Uh, this is a site which is a bit more specialised, I guess, but it's an example of when, web, when this kind of multi-author blog begins to look somewhat like a journal, in a way. So a lot of the articles on Cyborgology, which is a broad site exploring the sociology of technology, the sociology of digital technology, they often tend to be quite longer essay form articles that are fully referenced. And uh, yeah, it's quite interesting because, I mean, it's a site that has almost, it's, consolidated its own research agenda. There's a lot of people working within the framework that has become common on the site. And I think it's an interesting example of how the you know, multi-author blogging can be something not just extraneous to traditional academic publishing, but can actually start to act back upon it and influence the tendencies because people who are writing for this site are now regularly publishing scholarly journals where they're often developing and more fully working out ideas that first appeared on the site. But it also, uh, because of the nature of the format, as well as the longer essays, there's also other forms of content that exist on it as well. And again, as with the LC blogs, when you find sites like this, and they are becoming more common, uh, if you just try and contact the, look for an uh, invitation to contribute, or just if you can't find one, just contact whoever is listed as editing the site and see what they say. And uh, yeah, so we talked about then the uh, personal blogging and uh, guest blogging on sites. And another way of handling this is through uh, group blogging. Uh, and this is a, a very popular American sociology site uh, where it's a collective people who, as far as we well, all knew each other in real life and worked together before they founded the site. And it's grown since then. Well, there's a list of all the people who blog regularly for the site who are members of the group and there are also a range of people who blog on an occasionally regular basis for them. And you know, I think this can be a really great option if you do have uh, 
you know, an idea about friends and colleagues who you work on similar issues and you're all interested in blogging. And, you know, in a way, this is simultaneously the hardest, but also the easiest kind of site to set up and get off the ground. Because you do need to coordinate between the collective, the group who are doing the blogging, and be clear about the kind of theme, the kind of topic, the kind of uh, issues you'll be covering. But once you get it up and running, it is much easier to sustain a blog that's regularly updated if there are five or six of you doing it than if it is one yourself. And uh, when you get that kind of regularity of the update, you'll often find that a number of people that might surprise you begin reading it very quickly. And it's something that I think is really good to think about if you can, if you do have an obvious set of topics. So I mean, it's a format which, just to come on to the final example there, it works very well for research networks as well. So I mean, if you are working with other people on similar issues, you're running seminars with people where you discuss, you know, particular topics or particular groups of topics. This can be a very natural forum, both to collaboratively blog, but particularly when there are those, and it's hard not to fall into saying online and offline, but particularly when there are those offline relationships as well. It can be a really powerful way of consolidating a research network because, you know, say even if you have a very active research network, you still might have, you know, most of the monthly reading group have some organized seminars every few months. And this allows those conversations to build on the back of that and extend beyond it and consolidate the interaction and the working relationship between people who are involved. And this is an example of uh, the Digital Sociology Group, which I co-convened for the British Sociological Association. And as well as our offline activity, we have a very active blog where I try and post resources, post event announcements, post call for papers that are going to be relevant to people who work in digital sociology. <coughs> And uh, yeah, this is an example of how just writing a short post pointing to something you found interesting where it's just me reflecting on something uh, that was posted on the LSE Impact blog about the likely future of scholarly publishing. And it has course for papers, again, short blog posts, course for papers, and it can be a really helpful way of uh, you know, having a presence for a group, and it becomes very easy to discover, and you know, particularly because it's naturally international, and so occasionally people from outside the UK are coming to the digital sociology events that we run. But I know that lots of people from outside the UK are reading the blog on a regular basis, and you know, it just helps consolidate those networks in a way that can be really helpful. And if you do have that kind of research group or research network, a blog is a very powerful communications tool for it. And it can function as a, you know, as a holding page for the group, as well as a blog in a more traditional sense. And so it's perhaps less important that you update it regularly. It's just so it's there and people can discover it. And so they can find out what you're working on. And just one final example then. Um, this is a very large EU-funded project uh, that has 17, I think it has 27 project teams in 17 countries, so an awful lot of people and material going into it. And I think they're an interesting example of how, you know, if you are working, if you are running that sort of project, or, you know, even much smaller ones, at some point you're going to have findings that you want to disseminate. You know, you're going to be under pressure to demonstrate the impact of what it is you're doing. And for that kind of project, a blog at the outset has the advantage of allowing you to build an audience prior to the point where you actually have findings to disseminate. So they have different research teams writing on a regular basis. And you know, some of the content I think is fascinating. So events in Greece, for instance, uh, with you know, the rise of the Golden Dawn Fascist Party. And they have the Greek team of my place blogging on a regular basis about local politics in Athens. And I know from, from the person who runs the blog, you know, for him it's not a big addition to his work though once it's off the ground. You know, the biggest challenge he faced was as the admin of the project at the start having to hassle team members to think about posting for the blog. But once it became an established part of the project and once people thought of it naturally as something to do, you know, so interesting events have happened locally, we write about it for the project blog. They just emailed him on a semi-regular basis with these posts. He quickly proofreads them and puts them online. And I think this has been going for about a year and a half now. And they're getting to the point where they will actually have their proper real findings to disseminate. 
Um, the fact they've already got the project blog and the associated Twitter feed leaves them in a really advantageous position in terms of actually disseminating these findings. So rather than just have the standard mandated, you have to have a project website, which is then rarely updated, no one visits it because they have no reason to visit it, they now have this dynamic web presence which can be deployed really effectively when they get to the point in the project lifecycle where they have particular specific uses they can make of it. Yeah, so I mean, has anyone been involved in a project that has this kind of presence? Can you ask that again? I'm just Sorry, has anyone been involved in a project that has this kind of web presence? Projects that you think might have benefited from having a more dynamic web presence? Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know, this technology goes very easily with a shift away from a traditional way of seeing publishing in academia, which is that just putting stuff on a website is enough. You throw things on a microsite that's buried in a university domain name, and that's seen as publishing. Well, it is in a trivial sense, but I think there's this publishing as a continual process of making public and showing different aspects of the project, different aspects of the work to people on an ongoing basis. Sorry, do you have a question? Um, yeah, just something. I mean, I agree with everything you were saying um, about the project websites and everything. And with the, what you described as the recent kind of last six months, more of an imperative to, to work in that way in academia. I'm just wondering how that squares with um, the, the simultaneous increased pressure from the RAF, and for, especially for emergent uh, as well as who need to get into journals and things. So how much does this count towards that? Uh, I think no one really knows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess this is why it can lead to that kind of generalised pressure because it's obvious that this has something to do with impact. But I, at least as I understand these debates, I mean, it's not really concretely spelled out at length exactly what that some relationship is. I probably have a, a response to that, an answer to that. I don't know if you know. Um, I'm an academic uh, who's writing a lot, she's blogging a lot on um, academic writing and she has, she's supervising many PhDs. <coughs> Her name is Potter. Is what? Sorry? Potter. Potter. Yes. C -O -W -E -R. Yes. Um, so she's blogging very regularly and I follow her blog. I found it very interesting and very, very useful. Um, so at some point during the, the ref process, she posted a tweet outside and asked people to give her case studies or ask people whether they have used her posts to um, improve um, their scholarship or you know how what was the impact of specific articles she posted in terms of the ref. Because obviously you have specific requirements to, you need to give the impact mm -hmm. of what you're writing. So she was looking for case studies. And I bet she, she found some, <laughs> some people uh, because she has a very big audience. So that's something you can probably What's do. Um, I don't remember it, but okay. Okay. Yeah, um, it's, it's Potter. Um, I don't the first name. Pater. I can send you the link if you want. Do you know what institution she's in? I I can find it, but I'll tell you. I suppose yeah. if you're, the more, if you have a lot of online and you're writing about your work and what you do, they're more likely to go and seek out your uh, published stuff. So that's more likely to get cited. I think it's a, a dem demonstrable advantage yeah. in terms of, I mean, if you track the article views as well. You know, when a journal allows you to do that, you know, you mm -hmm. can see the impact that blogging and tweeting about research has. Mm -hmm. And there's article level metrics which let you track track the social media visibility of certain articles. <coughs> and uh, you know, my experience has been that if you're just blogging about them regularly, you very often find they're coming up in the top five percent of visibility. Which you know, I think my papers are reasonably good, but I know that that visibility is entirely down to blogging and tweeting about them rather than anything intrinsic about them. And you know, I think it just helps things circulate online and the more people see stuff, the more people are likely to read it. And as you say, the more they're likely to cite it. And it's really good to know about the way that these, the impact can be articulated in the context of a case study for the ref. 
because I think that's likely to become more common over time. Because it seems you know this is this you know this this technology is emerging at a time of big change in how you know auditing works in higher education, and I think the full ramifications have yet to really been spelled out, yet to be spelled out entirely. But I think it's something that is starting to be recognised as structurally very significant to what it is that academics do, and it's likely to become more so. I think Mark's absolutely right that it's, it's uniquely problematic at the moment because impact has never been part of the ref before. So it really is the case that nobody knows how it's going to play out, and that's why it's so hard to make these decisions about what is the best thing for you to do. And I think that comes back nicely to Mark's point of just think what you want to get out of it and whether it's something you're going to enjoy and don't feel it's something you have to do and then you'll probably do it very much better. Unless your line manager tells you that you do have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd say just make the best of it. There's, in a way there's a worry there that at the moment it's relatively new, although it's uh, 10, 12 years old probably, it's relatively new, uh, it's exciting, it's generating a lot of interest, but once it becomes this institutionalised, it actually will lose some of that, um, some of that edge. Once, once blogs get, get incorporated in building metrics, that, that sort of I think there's a real, I don't think it's faithful, but I think there's a real danger that what is liberating about the technology could quite quickly be lost if it's institutionalised. And, you know, I think there are people in my sort of situation who are seeing the temptation because their online profile is bigger than their offline profile of arguing this should be audited in the same way. And I can see the temptation of them saying that, but I think it's a real mistake to try and argue for these things to be proactively incorporated into traditional auditing systems. You know, one of the things I'm enthusiastic about this it is still, although becoming less so, outside of the traditional circuits of control and power within the academy. Right, I think unfortunately we could probably go on for a lot longer, but I'm going to have to leave it there. And thank you very much, Mark, for a fascinating presentation. Thanks very much. Lots of things to go and read, I think, for everybody. So uh, if we could just thank Mark. Thank you.